it's typical Villa to sort of bottle it now. I don't think it is. I'd probably snog Brucey just to get him out of the way. You ever cried at the Villa? No, I don't cry. I don't. <laughs> All right. Do we look short on the videos? Like, I know you only sort of see me from here and above, but do we give off short energy? I don't know. Voice makes me gag. Well, I, I disagree. I love the Brummie accent, so. Another one? That accent was designed for moaning. Imagine being a Brummie. Right, hello and welcome back to another Villa on Tour video. I am your host for today, Max Stokes, joined as ever by Amsterdam's finest karaoke merchant, Simon Lyons. How are you, mate? All good? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah, look at his face. He's buzzing for the uh, karaoke bars in Lille. Um, what does any YouTube channel do during an international break? It's a Q&A. So it's going to be a slightly longer video today. We've got a, a trusty hat of questions here. Randomly, it's a for the love of Paul McGrath a bucket hat that we acquired in Dublin um, a couple of months ago. So there's about 20 questions in there. We're going to have a brief chat about the Villa first, because, I mean, there's Villa questions in there but a lot of them are quite random about us youtube life not necessarily villa related so a bit of fun in there so should be a more exciting video something different get to know us a little bit more and just have a chat really so grab yourself a cup of tea um and just enjoy the sort of longer format of the, of the show today we're filming somewhere slightly different as you can tell hockley social club uh, near the jewelry quarter if you ever want a couple of drinks or live music it's such a cool space here and they've obviously been kind enough to let us film so a massive shout out to hockley social club so simon how are you my international break, we were just talking briefly before we came on. Has it come at a good time for Villa? I think after that West Ham game, it felt like it was a good point. Probably wasn't our greatest performance, set up slightly differently. It's a couple of games now, isn't it, where Unai Emery set up slightly differently in the Tottenham game and the West Ham game. So I think it's a good time for me to just reset a little bit, get a couple of players closer back from injury, obviously, um, and just sort of, like I said, reset a little bit. Yeah, I think it's been a, a hectic schedule as well, hasn't it? And I think, you know, we've had game after game through the Conference League, through the Premier League, and so... We've been battling on on all fronts, kind of thing. We've a lot of injuries as well, as we have as we have been all season, essentially. And you know, the manager just keeps finding ways to sort of overcome these injuries, doesn't he? And uh, and yeah, you're right. Over the last couple of weeks, we tried something slightly different in the Spurs and West Ham games, I suppose. Um, and so, I, yeah, I guess it, I guess it does come at, at a good time to sort of refresh, refocus. Um, I think my only my only concern is that a lot of these games that are being played are sort of friendly games, sort of warm up to to the Euros. A lot of them are friendlies, and so you, you're kind of thinking, you know, with ten games to go of the season, everyone just wants to everyone just wants to focus on the Premier League now, don't they? It's the business end of the season, and, and now our players are, are you know are, are going off on international duty, running the risk of getting injured, and it's it's yeah, it's, it's one of them. Like you're, you're you're praying the phone don't ring. You, you, you're praying that someone doesn't get injured sort of thing now with, with, with sort of 10 games in the season to go. So, yeah, it probably come at a good time in terms of, in terms of how Villa are, uh, are shaping up, but you're just sort of praying that we don't get any injuries. Yeah, we saw Matty Cash, didn't we? I think it was pulling his hamstring for Poland the other night. Not ideal. The last thing we need is any more injuries. How are you sort of feeling now in terms of the last, like you said, 10 games now? It's really starting to hot up. If Villa are going to get top four at any point, it's got to be this season. Obviously, we've got to juggle the Conference League as well. I saw the Claret and Blue podcast did this and John Townley said he was sort of 65% positive or sure that we were going to get even in the top five. I think I'd be much more confident of that. I've already said that I wouldn't worry about Manchester United, like I said, famous last words. Um, but I'm feeling positive. I am feeling positive going to this last important stretch of the season. Yeah, me too. I, I feel really positive about it. And, I, and I've, said it, I've said it for a long time. I, think there's, I don't think there's a lot between us and Spurs. I think I've said that for a while. And, and I think... I say that because I think Spurs maybe individually have got some better players the likes of Madison, Son etc I said that for a, a while um, but their team hasn't been together as long as, as Villa's I think Villa have got that sort of more I don't know sort of sort of together team they've been together a, a lot longer I still think Villa have got the the better manager so that's in our corner as well I think it'll be tight between us and Spurs but I feel like we, we, we're able to show uh, a much better better level of consistency than, than, than Spurs do but I, I think it's going to be tight we've got very similar fixtures we've all got the top three to play kind of thing we've both still got Chelsea to play we've, bo we've both got very similar fixtures look you, you can't rule Man United out can you? you you can't rule them out because we know that on the day they're, they're still a, a decent side and they can win football matches because they, they've got decent players but I'm confident I think I think I think we'll definitely finish in the top five. Um, it's looking like that might just be enough. Arsenal have got Bayern Munich, obviously, in the Champions League. That'll be an important game. West Ham battering Freiburg. Obviously, this is all for the coefficient. It's basically England versus Germany at this point, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and the big yeah, and so the, the draw the draws could have been better for us, really. I mean, as you say, Arsenal got Bayern Munich, and a lot of people are saying Bayern Munich will definitely win. I'm not so sure about that. I, th I don't think Bayern Munich are the team that they used to be, and I think Arsenal are sort of riding on the crest of a wave a little bit at the moment. So I'd, I'd, I'd back Arsenal to get the job done. In 
that one. And then I think the one that you look like you think, well, England might lose a team there is West Ham against Leverkusen in the yeah. in the Europa League. Obviously, Leverkusen have barely lost all season, have they? And so, um, yeah, I think that's the one. But yeah, it's England versus Germany. But if we can have a couple of teams go all the way, even Liverpool Villa. and yeah. Villa. I mean, Liverpool should win the, yeah. the Europa League. I still bat Man City to to go all the way in the Champions League I think this is the time of year when they just come into their own I think we can get top four I really do and I think looking at Spurs last weekend how poor they were against Fulham um, it was a bit of a shock that was but I've said all along if you if you take the game to Tottenham you can get at them their, their defence isn't great which is so frustrating because we kind of blew our chance to go even further yeah. against them to be fair with the way that we settled but it's one of them and it, Wolves after the international break obviously local derby half five at Villa Park you've got to be winning that as well well yeah and that's kind of it's not a must win but it's the type of games on paper where you think right Villa are going to Villa are going to get you know, your top four your you probably need to win what? what? What do you need to win? You probably need to win what, another four, five games, maybe. And it's those games against Wolves. It's the, it's the games at home against Brentford, Bournemouth, Bournemouth even like Chelsea, mm. away at teams like Brighton, Palace. It's those sort of games that Villa will be looking at to to really secure the place. But you know, what? I am confident though. And I've seen I've seen a lot of people say like in recent weeks that oh, it's a typical Villa to sort of bottle it now. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think, you know, you were looking at Villa this time last season when we were, you know, we were thinking, well, could, could we have a run to, to finish in Europe? And we had an incredible run. OK, we weren't dealing with the, the, the volume of injuries that, that we are right now. But I think Villa have been so consistent, though, under Unai Emery. And maybe the two halves of the season have been very different. The first half of the season, we were sort of blowing teams away and we were sort of, you know, being absolutely incredible, weren't we? Second half of the season, I think teams have wised up a little bit. We're not playing like that now. But... We've found other ways to win and find other ways to get points. And uh, Villa have been remarkably consistent, um, averaging what? Just under it's two points a game. Two points it? a game, which is remarkably consistent. And so I think if Villa were going to drop off now, it would be an almighty collapse, if I'm being honest, because, just because of how consistent we've been. So, yeah, if you're asking me if I'm confident uh, ahead of this final running, then yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. And I think people have talked about the sort of blip that Villa have been on but we still pick up points like last season we would have lost that West Ham game obviously we we could have at the end with obviously that dodgy VAR call and stuff but it, it still feels like that looting game felt massive in terms of just picking up results and picking up points and you haven't been great obviously the other team might have been a little bit better but you still you earn your own luck don't you and you start picking up points especially that losing game it just felt massive and that's what like we said top four teams do that's the villa chat that's the um the boring football side of things should we uh, ask a few well should we have a look at the, some of these questions then like we said a lot of them aren't football related some of them about us and just random youtube questions really so it's a bit of fun so uh, i'm gonna let you the the, uh, the magic paul mcgrath hat Let's have, a look at that. have the first one I feel like i'm doing the fa cup draw or something yeah. here so, so the first one is probably our favourite from oh, really? that came round on uh, on Twitter yesterday. So it comes from Orion, okay. Snog Marry Avoid. Oh wow! So you've got Steve Bruce, mm -hmm. Sam Allardyce, wow. or Jurgen Klopp. Now off air, you said you've got a hundred percent. Like you know oh, what yeah. you're going to say here. So I'll go first. Go I'll avoid Jurgen Klopp because he does my head in. Hundred percent. I can't be dealing with him. Sorry. He just everything about him just annoys me. Um, the other two's quite hard. I don't know. I think I'd I'd probably snog Brucey just to get him out of the way because I don't think I could marry him because I just think he'd annoy me again. I think Sam Allardyce has got a bit about him, so I'll I'll marry him. See, I'm a little bit different there. Sam Allardyce scares me a little bit. I don't know. Brucey scares like... me though because because though with Steve Bruce, like he seems okay, he seems fairly like calm, and then he'll just lose it like that, which scares me. See, I think Bruce is just a lovely man, and I think he'd be love. No, I don't. I think he's a lovely bloke, yeah. and I just think he's an all-round good bloke. And I know he's been, you know, he gets taken the mick out of the press, but yeah, for me, I'd. I'd marry Bruce. Uh, I'd avoid Sam Allardyce just because he scares me. The whole like snog Klopp. Yeah, I think so. Just to get it out of the way because I out the way. I don't, yeah, I don't want to snog Allardyce. He, he scares me a little bit. It's like the whole like pint of like yeah, gravy yeah. like from up yeah. north. Sort of thing. He, just, he just scares me a little yeah, bit. So um, so yeah, I'd go uh, I'd go avoid Allardyce. Snog Klopp. Mar <laughs> marry Bruce. Uh. Great content this is. Right, next one. Oh, okay. So this is the question that came up so much on Instagram and Twitter. Everybody wants to know this one, right? So what are your jobs? How does Villa sort of impact on your life? What sacrifices do you have to make? What does your time off look like? Because obviously we go to all, all Villa games, home and away. So the first one that came up, people want to know what our jobs are. I think people, some people sort of expect that I do Villa on tour full time, um, which I wish I did. I didn't. I've got a normal Monday to Friday, nine to five job where it's sort of in a similar sort of industry, if you like, like I do videography and photography. Um, so that's sort of my thing for a, a large company. Um, so, yeah, I don't do YouTube full time. I'd love to. Um, I guess when you're covering one club with a YouTube channel, the sort of 
audience base is is limited really i think if you do general football content your subscribers can go hundreds and hundreds of thousands but if you are so covered by one club like i only do villa i'd only ever want to do villa there's only a certain amount of villa fans and i think villa on tour is quite good because you do get other fans of other clubs watching it because it's a group mates going to the football and it's funny and it's a laugh and stuff like that but i think yeah i'd love it to be a full-time job but at the moment it's it's not yeah, that's the dream, isn't it? That's the dream. But yeah, for me, yeah, I'm um, I'm a nurse in the NHS, uh, uh, n- not sort of on the on the front line anymore. So that's how I get my uh, sort of my weekends off and uh, and and like night times off sort of thing. I, I just work uh, long hours, four four days a week, sort of office hours, and so um, that enables me to yeah to to go to the villa on weekends and stuff. So I don't I don't need to miss any. So yeah. I think people talk about annual leave a lot as well, and it's like, where do you get all this annual leave from? I, I get 25 days, just like anybody else. And you just have to manage it, don't you? Like, we yeah. talk about how much annual leave have you got? Are you using two days for Lille? Are you using three days for Lille? I'm going to use in two days. We're going late on a Wednesday, for example, because I need to save that Wednesday with uh, Fenerbahce away in mind, with Athens in mind. So it may seem like it's really easy for us to go home and away, and we are privileged in that respect, but it does take a lot of sacrifice as well in terms yeah. of giving up on, on family holidays or you've only got a couple of days left to go away with the missus or something like that like it's 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 not ideal but I guess if you want to go home and away and keep up your reference to go to all these European yeah. games, it's got to be done. Yeah, and as you say, it's the it's for, for me the vast majority of annual leave is is used on on Villa. It's like using half days to go to say Man City away in a couple of weeks, or using a couple of days when we go to Lille and whatever. And um, and yeah, it's kind of like sacrifice, as you say, sacrificing holidays, family holidays and stuff. And uh, and I always say like a lot of my holidays tend to be like sort of pre season trips yeah. to follow Villa again. It's I, I combine it, I combine it into the one, don't I? So um, but yeah, it's it's yeah it's no secret we're not, we're not sitting on like a massive bank of of days off it's just that yeah we we have to utilize our annual leave and yeah we do it fairly well so so next one is uh, if you could have any job in the world that isn't youtube what would you do again job isn't youtube youtube would be the dream imagine like doing villa on tour like that's just yeah as a full-time thing that'll be unreal but i think it obviously would be something my passion is videography photography creating content i think being the like the club photographer or the creating content for the club that'd be brilliant yeah i don't think working in media in football is is great really because they do for me exploit people in terms of how much they pay and things like this because they know that so many people would jump at the chance to work at a football club they do sort of compromise that by paying not great wages and things like that so footballing money if you're not a footballer or a manager or something isn't great um but yeah creating content in football full-time would be unreal and i think you've got um you've got an answer to this haven't you yeah i think you know what for me i think i've always just wanted to work at, at villa i think before before i had any sort of uh, ambitions to go to uni or anything i was like oh, i just work for villa i work in the club shop or the ticket office or something <laughs> like that i just i just wanted to be down at villa park all the time to be honest with you but yeah i don't, I don't know like I, I always say like i wish like Football clubs would come out with like a, a club nurse kind of role, so I could <laughs> easily take that up. Or, or yeah, I, I always say the the person that's got the best job in the world, without a doubt, is Damien Vidigani, who, who who works alongside Emery. What is he now? He's the director of football operations at that. He's club, probably got it? some some funny role, some president of yeah. something. But basically, all we see of him is that he waits on the side of a pitch to sort of hug Emery at the end of a game, yeah. and he's basically like his translator and things like this, isn't he? I think his role's grown a bit. I, I think he came in. I'm as, sure he does he, more than that. He came in as like Emery's chief of staff, didn't yeah. he? And Emery's deputy kind of thing but because he's been with him for a while hasn't he like yeah. he takes him everywhere yeah but like he works clo- very closely alongside Mancino doesn't yeah. he unlike the on the football operation side of the club so but I think he's got an absolutely incredible job so <laughs> if uh, yeah if they want to if, if, if Damien has to go and they want to replace him with anyone then Damien. I'm your man so next question we have got how do you always get the back of the coach do you own the bus company no it's a bit of a boring answer really we just get on at the first stop and nobody else really gets on. So we just get the back seats. And we have done for about seven years. And because we're like Villa's hardest, nobody wants to come to the back <laughs> and get us out the way, do they? It's basically because we were just there at the coach stuff very early, isn't it? And we just, we get on first. Boring it's, answer. It's a very right? boring answer. It's a, good, it's a good group on the coach though, isn't it? Because it's been like the sort of same 50 people going for years and years. Like you just know everybody on the coach. And it is, it is wicked. Like you say hello to everyone. Obviously we all go to the same pub and just have a chat and stuff. So you're not just in your sort of group of five or six, are you? Like you just get on with everyone and it is wicked I think that's what the Villa away scene is a little bit like though you get to know like you probably get to know like, hundreds of people really when you think about it don't like, you it's, it's rare that you see someone in the away and that you haven't seen before yeah. or don't know it's like, it always makes me laugh like walking through the streets of Amsterdam and 
or wherever we've been away in the European Poland, whatever, and you just see like people that that, that you know, and you know, you're, you're shaking hands about twenty times yeah. as you walk down like a, a two hundred yard sort of path sort of thing. Yeah. Like it always just makes me laugh. But yeah, no, it's a good group who gets the coach. Yeah, we always enjoy it, don't we? Yeah, I think the one that made me laugh was just in Bosnia, just walking through these back streets in a country you would never have dreamt of visiting, and just seeing some bloke who lives five minutes away from you and yeah. just expecting it. Like yeah. it, it is wicked and it's totally random, but I love it. Working with other vloggers. Who do you admire? This might be a bit weird, but I don't really watch a lot of football vloggers. I don't know. I think because, like I said earlier, like I only really care about Villa. Yeah. So I wouldn't really watch another club's designated vlogger unless it was like from a mad game or something like that. But I like, I think especially with YouTube, it's got to be your personality. Yeah. Like anyone can film a football match or film somebody warming up or film a goal or whatever but I think it's all about personality which I think not to blow our own trumpet but I think that's why we do quite well because we are a genuine group of mates who obviously get on on camera and off camera and I just think that's what people want to see they want to see us have a laugh and obviously when Villa are doing well that's that's brilliant and stuff but I watch Ellis from away days like that's that again he's got a personality it's not all about the football match I think if you watch one of my videos probably about 35 40 percent is the actual game a lot of it is talking more yeah. generally us in the pub whatever so I think YouTube to succeed on there in the football space it's all about personality yeah I think you're right I think you're right and I'm fairly similar I, I basically only really watch sort of Villa stuff but um, yeah I've, I've, I've seen a few things of, of, of other clubs but I think you're right it's I always get sort of attracted to the ones where it's not just all about the football where there is a little bit of uh, personality so yeah but I don't I don't watch any of them religiously but yeah there's a lot of good ones out there though I think it's ones with maybe more generally football related ones that have like a storyline like when Ellis went to San Marino or going to random places funny stadiums things like that something yeah. that you can create a piece of content around a storyline I think that's that's what I enjoy watching um, this one we'll rattle through this quickly favourite away day of every season doing Villa on tour so I started this channel in 2017 so there's a couple of COVID years in there, but we'll start 17-18. Um, I think my favourite away day that season was probably the one where Villa on tour started. Barnsley away, 3-0. Keenan Davis scored like one of his only goals for Villa. Everyone was on the pitch. That was wild. I didn't go to that one, but um, I think for me that season it would have to be the Sheffield Wednesday one, I suppose. Was it 4-2, wasn't it? Glenn, Glenn, Whelan scored. It was that, it was that actually famous game where uh, Dr Tony sent a message down to Steve Bruce at half-time to say, uh, you need to substitute Glenn Whelan. And then, and then Keith Wyness and uh, Steve Bruce ignored that. Uh, message from Dr Tony and then obviously Glenn Whelan scored in the second half with 1-4-2 and that is that is a that is a big um, a big lesson to learn in owners should not be interfering with managers definitely absolutely mental um, the following season 18-19 obviously the promotion season plenty in there I think everybody likes to talk about the Rotherham game because that had a lot of feeling about it I remember so clearly getting on the bus after that game and it just yeah. felt absolutely massive like you felt like we're getting promoted here but I think for me it'll be the Sheffield Wednesday game the game before what was the score? 3-2. Three 3-2. Two. Three two. two late goals. It's 3-1. Three no, 3-1. Three 3-1. One. Three three one. One. So we obviously scored a last-minute winner to win 2-1 and then we scored again with Tammy Abraham and it was just 6,000 Villa in that way and it was... Yeah, and that was one where Jed Steer saved the penalty yeah. as well, wasn't it? And Perfect. Yeah, for me, it would be that one or or the one after the Rotherham one. As I said, um, I said to you, off camera didn't I that it was just a feeling it was just a feeling of that game it was like you, we beat Rotherham and again in, in adversity really as well we've gone down to 10 men and Dean Smith, the penalty. Dean Smith made that made that change he brought Kodger on um, we went two up top and it, it, it kind of felt like when we won that game it kind of felt like we're going to get promoted this year um, and so that's probably why it sticks in the mind for me but yeah those two definitely um, the season our first season in the Premier League then not too many to choose from you've got Norwich 5-1 that was decent but I think the Brighton game was good I think it was only 1-1 to be fair but you watch that clip of when Grealish lashes that in and that away end is one of the best scenes the noise is one of the best ever it just I know it was only to get a draw but that was that was class yeah and it's always the day at Brighton isn't it though it's always love it. it's always a bit unique you know you sort of have a drink on the beach don't you and we've always been <laughs> we've always been really lucky at Brighton we've always had like really nice weather even though yeah, even we've, all, we've always been in the winter um, and yeah it's always been really nice weather really sunny and so having a drink on the beach it's just that it's just that it's a little bit of a different away day isn't it and so you're not in spoons and as you say we we, we managed to uh 
you know, to get that equaliser. But that I remember that day as well. It felt like a big point that did though, because we were sort of decimated of injury. Do you remember like uh, Vasilev was up front for Vasilev us? Vasilev was running round. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Well, like when Greedy scored, Vasilev was there as well. Um, and so What's he doing now? exactly, yeah, God knows. I have no idea. Following season, then the season we came back from COVID, so twenty one, twenty two, Leeds away was decent midweek, three um, 0 That was class. But I think there's only one winner for this one. The Man United. Yeah, game. it has to be the Man United one. That was that early kickoff wasn't it? We went up really, really early. We stayed over in Manchester for the weekend, didn't we? And Courtney Hawes got that winner in what was it the 88th minute and then um and then they missed the penalty didn't they in the in the 90 yard minute was it who was it was it uh, was it fernandez it was, it was fernandez yeah because martinez famously went up to ronaldo and yeah. said why aren't you taking it why aren't you taking it that's right yeah and the penalty was so bad it's not like he saved yeah. it like that was in the upper tier probably right? ballooned it didn't they? yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so good and then just coming out of that like obviously everybody knows Villa's record against Manchester United especially well I say especially away from home it's probably better away from home isn't it than at home yeah. but it, it's just that was just perfect like a last minute winner I think that was was that just before Dino lost five in a row it was wasn't it yeah, was that it was. sort of early on in the season yeah. so to one of Dino's last sort of proper good games like it was a, a decent way to go out we'll forget about the five game losing streak um, but the season after that 22-23 there's quite a few in here obviously the first season of Unai Emery plenty to choose from Chelsea away, Everton away, again Brighton away. We had a great season, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we did. And when he came in, we were just winning away game after after away game, weren't we? So, yeah, it was a it was a bit of a sea change for us, wasn't it? We weren't used to winning so many away games. But for me, I think it has to be that Chelsea one for me. It kind of felt like the starting point was something big that I did though, because we beat Chelsea, and then a few days later we went to beat Leicester on the Tuesday night. We were, we were stuck in like eleventh place, and I think yeah. Chelsea were what tenth. So winning that game actually leapfrogged us, and yeah. it felt like we were in eleventh for so long. And then once we won that Chelsea game in early April, wasn't it? We yeah. just we just went. Yeah, that was it. We went on an incredible run, and then obviously we ended up finishing Europe, which everyone would have laughed at if you'd have said that to them in like the the, the previous October when Gerard got sacked and Emery came in. So yeah, probably the Chelsea one for me. And then this season you've got a few. Tottenham away was obviously brilliant, but I think it's got to be that Luton game. A lot of people have said that's one of the best videos on the channel. I think it is as well. It was just just brilliant, and I say it because it's it's rare for me to go to a new stadium and especially in the Premier League go to a new stadium that away and everybody loves it I loved it it was brilliant um, and a last minute winner as well you can't beat that no and it was a great game wasn't it obviously we were racing to that two goal lead and, uh, and they came back as the Luton always do but then we got that last minute goal but yeah you're right the stadium the half five kick off everything about that day was just really 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 good so yeah I agree Luton Luton's definitely up there for so me. so good this is the thing that everybody says whenever they see us in person this is the comment they make who's taller me or you Right, but everybody says when they see us, "Oh, you're taller. You're taller in real life." It's like, do we look short on the videos? Like, I know you only sort of see me from here and above, but do we give off short energy? I don't know. I don't know, but every, you're right. Everyone does say that. Everyone, uh, everyone always says, "Have you been in like a grow bag or something?" Don't they like to us? And oh, I didn't realise you were that tall. And I don't know who's taller though. I'm not really. I'm I never, think I think we're the same. You know. I, I, oh dear, I, okay. I don't know. I'd, I've never really, I've never really. I mean, some bloke measured us in a pub in Amsterdam, and I think we were all a bit drunk uh, at that. Yeah, point. I, I don't remember that. <laughs> Shock. Um, but I think we're what? Would you say you're six foot three? S- yeah, six foot two, six foot three, somewhere between that. I would have thought. So I think we're all tall at Villa tall. Like Owen and Jamie are like similar, aren't they? So you're not allowed in like this group unless you're like six foot three. I think Jamie's like, the tallest. Yeah, he must be like six five or something. Jamie's the proper proper. Like, like on the video against West Ham, I was stood next to him and I was like that. Yeah, I, and I, like I don't really look short that often. Yeah, I feel like I'm looking up to to <laughs> Jamie definitely. So yeah. Next Next one is from Harry. How do you deal with negative comments? Um, I mean, you just have to you just have to deal with it. I mean, I've done this channel. If you put, I think if you put your face out there, especially in football where everyone's so tribal and everyone wants to have a go at everyone all the time for your opinions and various things, you just have to sort of deal with it. I think early on, obviously, I, it was like a shock to the system. But I think because I've been doing it for so long now, you've got to deal with it, haven't you? Suck it up. And I'd, I think Twitter's the worst. I don't really tweet anymore unless I'm promoting a video because I just can't be dealing with people on Twitter um, but we don't really we rarely get it in real life it's just social media isn't it yeah there's just a the minority of idiots out there isn't there and I, and I think it's you're right it's like social media the stuff people say to you on social media that would never say to you in, in your face kind of thing and I, and I think sometimes with this kind of thing because you're out you know on, on, on videos a lot or on podcasts quite a lot and stuff people think they know you don't they yeah. that's, the, that's the other thing people think they really know you like personally um, when in reality they don't know hardly anything about your life essentially and so I always do find, I, I actually find it quite funny when someone has a dig I, m- maybe I wouldn't have been like that a few years ago but when someone has a dig now I just find it quite funny I just <laughs> laugh it off these days because it really really doesn't bother me or bother my life so yeah crack on Producer Tiff, can you pass me my phone? Because I've taken a screenshot of a few hate comments on the West Ham video. I've screenshotted a few uh, 
hate comments on the West Ham video. And this is, this is like one video just to give you a bit of context around like yeah. what's going on. Dude, invest in some blinds or at least curtains from this century. So talking about my bedroom, which is good. Someone called me Specky here. That's a new one. How annoying is that voice? That's our brummy, brummy accents. Well, no, there's so many comments about our voices. If it's that bad, don't come back. Referring to the stadium, I wish. Do you ever stop moaning? Good. Can we write that dialect next? I'm, I'm afraid it's just a, it's a, it's a brummy dialect. What, 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 can, what can I say? I'd say the same about the Cockney ones. Is that it? Exactly. It's, look, we're just honest, working class people from Birmingham. So <laughs> if, what, what, what are you going to get? This know? one's the best, right? Voice makes me gag. Well, I disagree. I love the Brummie accent, so... Again, another one? That accent was designed for moaning. Imagine being a Brummie. Come oh, it's, on. I, I've got to say, any West Ham fans watching it, or any Cockneys watching it, being a Brummie is absolutely incredible, so yeah, up really the Birmingham. Is. Rattling through these. Top three beers from Jeeves, I think is how you... How, who asked that? Um, I love a beer I do, as you can probably tell, um, but... I don't like any of the boring stuff like your Carlins or anything like that. I like the funky ones. You know when you go into a pub and they've got like a, a massive loads and loads on draft and they're all like funky ones like IPAs or pale ales and stuff like that. That's so me. That is like fruity beers. I just love stuff like that. Like when, when we were on the um, train down to Fulham, like what did I have? The disco forklift truck. You know them weird beers you can get from like Sainsbury's and stuff. Like I think I've got a, a Yorkshire pudding beer that I haven't touched because that scares me a little bit. Um, but just like the funky ones, the fruity ones, the ones with weird names. Yeah, I see I'm not a massive beer connoisseur. Kind of I like a beer. I do like a beer, but um, as you know, on like away days and stuff, for me, it's like I'll have a couple of beers and I need to move on to something else. I can't, I can't just continually keep drinking beer. So I'm a little bit boring with it, really. Like I just like the standard, like your Coronas and your uh, what's it, your Birra and yeah, your and stuff like that, which are all right. But I, I tend to have like two to three. Um, unless there's like a happy hour and there's like a picture on offer or something like it was in Amsterdam, um, and then I'll quickly move on to like a, a whiskey or a vodka or yeah, something like that. So. I like a blue moon as well. I don't mind a blue moon. Again, fruity. Yeah. Put that slice of orange in the top. Or eight. Yeah. Yeah. Eight's like more more orange the better. I don't mind. Oh, okay. This is a Villa related one for once. All time favourite Villa memory from Scott. I, I, it's hard, that is, isn't it? Because I've got, you know, I've got probably loads of little like quirky ones, which people will be like, oh, I don't well, like. For, yeah, it's for different reasons, though, isn't it? I think the big, I think the biggest one, the biggest like moment of elation, has to be, for me, it has to be beating Derby in the playoff final. I know that sounds a little bit tin part. Like people think, oh, it's Aston Villa you shouldn't be celebrating like playoff victories. Yeah, but we, we don't win anything though. <laughs> exactly. Like I've never seen Villa win anything. You know, when we won, when we won the ninety uh, ninety four League Cup and the ninety six League Cup, I was what. Uh, two and four respectively so might not even been that it might have been like three I think actually something like that so I don't remember that so I've never seen Villa win anything so the playoffs was a really big moment for me and it was it was the culmination of that 10 game winning run wasn't it and just the general feeling and how rubbish it had been to follow Villa up until that point it had been really really rubbish for the majority of me watching watching Aston Villa and so that just felt like a massive moment of elation so I'll, I'll have to pick that one you ever cried at the villa? No, I don't cry. I don't. <laughs> All right. I don't. <laughs> Lack I, of emotion. No, I just. No, I don't. Do you know, uh, football. I don't. I don't. I don't I've, I've got to be honest. I've never, ever cried at Have football. you ever felt yourself like tearing up a little bit? Like that bit of emotion? Like. I felt like, you know, like you feel like the goosebumps, don't you? Yeah. Like, I felt that, but I've never, I've never felt like I'm about to cry or, or like my eyes go water or anything like that. No. I have. There's a famous picture of me at West Brom. I say famous picture. I mean, people have sent it to me. Of me at West Brom when we obviously beat them in the semi-finals. Um, I, I'd say that, though, is my best Villa memory. I just think that, that was just brilliant in that way. And at West Brom, like, obviously the player final was brilliant. But I think Wembley, it's not the greatest stadium in the world for creating atmosphere and stuff. But I think especially at West Brom away in that tiny sort of away end and winning in such fashion on what felt like a, such a long night because it went to extra time. It was a hot night as well. It was just so long. The stadium announcer was so loud. I can still hear it now. The penalty shootout was unreal. Adoma could have won it and he missed just to add a little bit more jeopardy. And then to win it like that and that away end was brilliant. It was so, so good. And that's when I did actually cry. Like the emotion just was mental and I was just stood there tearing up, crying, man, like it was brilliant. And uh, hopefully I'll be doing that in Athens again. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't judge anyone for crying. Absolutely, like go for it. It, if that's what if that's what floats your boat go for it but i don't mean to cry i just can't help it i know but i just i just don't get that natural i just don't get that natural feeling i'm just cold man i'm not no nah, i'm just buzzing <laughs> i remember no to be fair like it felt quite like again poignant against brighton on the last day of last season so when we got yeah. europe that was another one um I didn't feel like crying. I was just absolutely buzzing i was just beaming from yeah. ear to ear really. even like looting i felt emotional though not, not, not to the extent of crying, but it just felt, it just felt emotional. Like, yeah. oh my god, like we could do something special here. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, 
Um, I guess this is more one for me. Uh, how do you manage slash cope with the stigma around people recording at football matches? That comes from Liam. I think there is a sort of stigma, but I think it's been going on for so many years now. Like, it's not a new thing, is it? Um, about people vlogging at the football or recording or having their phones out and stuff. But I think I've done it for so many years now. I mean, you'll know better than anyone being next to me at most Villa games. Like, it's not like I'm recording for 90 minutes, is it? And I, I wouldn't want to do that because, again, that would take away from my experience. Like, even when we're on the attack or something, I don't look through the camera. Or I don't have the camera up here. Like, I'm watching the game like anybody else. I've just got the camera out. Like, I know how to, I don't have to look at the camera to record or anything like that. And I just, I just love it though because it's creating memories and looking back. Like we talk about those games, our best full of memories. You can go on YouTube and look at them like now for us. Like it's not in here. Like you can actually go and watch it, and that's that's why I do it. That's the reason. And again, for people all over the world, because Villa are so massive. There's Villa fans everywhere, and hearing them say how brilliant it is, like that just that encourages me to keep on doing what I'm doing. And people will watch this and these videos from all over the world and they'll comment from wherever. And it was poignant when we went to America, wasn't it? Like, they're on the other side of the world, basically. And they're saying they watch Villa on tour and they love what we do. And it's just, it's mad. So that's that's what, that comes so much higher than a stigma around recording at football matches. Like, I'm, I don't really care about that, to be honest. Well, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It doesn't affect anybody else, that's does the it? Thing. That's the thing. It doesn't affect anybody else's day. And, that, and as you say, like, you know, I stand next to you and half the time you don't even realise that that any recordings going on sort of thing and so as you say it's a way of capturing memories it's, it's a bit of a bit of fun isn't it it's a bit of a laugh and uh you know it's not like you're standing there with like a massive like film crew all around you with, like massive cameras and, like a booming mic or anything like that it's, it's like i might get you to do that actually well yeah yeah operator. it's uh, yeah it's an option but no you know what it's I, I don't i don't understand that i don't i don't understand when people pick faults at, at stuff like that it, it, it's got no bearing on what they do on their life so what does it matter i mean if i was going up to people and shoving cameras in people's faces or making it really obvious what I was doing or shouting and being really annoying I, I get it yeah. but I, I try and be subtle like I'm so so conscious of what I'm doing like who's behind me who's in front of me can they hear what I'm doing like I obviously try and keep it to myself um, so people aren't affected by it so the next one is from Paul uh, will you be making another trip over to America again depends on the annual leave situation depends on whether, whether Villa gets to the final against Athens because obviously we'll have to do that we, like, we have to make sacrifices like I'd love to do every single yeah. game but I think there's rumours about Chicago, New York, Columbus crew, is it, in America pre-season. So potentially not this season unless we lose to Lille and then there's plenty of opportunity to do that. We'll save a bit of money by not going to the final or whatever. Um, so potentially, but if we get to the Conference League final, probably not. Yeah, I think for me, prob well, no, probably not at all this year, to be honest with you. Just for, for a few different reasons, I, I wouldn't be able to get the time off like I did last year um, in terms of annual leave. I know other people have booked it, unfortunately. Um, but also finance-wise as well, I think Europe, Europe has absolutely <laughs> battered my bank account. I've got to be totally honest. Absolutely battered my bank account. So... Um, I can't see it happening this year sort of thing and I think I said I'd do like a European mm. one if we get there this season and I think the other reason for me is as well is that um, it's you know it's going to be the same sort of side of America again if it was if it was West Coast if it was somewhere if it was somewhere new you know we were playing I don't know like in Los Angeles or whatever Las Vegas Villain that's yeah cool. something like that then I'd, I'd probably uh, want to make more of an effort to do it but last year was absolutely incredible in America we absolutely loved it it was probably my favourite trip I've ever ever done um but yeah, it's uh, maybe a bit of a challenge to do every single summer sort of thing. So I, I'll, I'll probably be giving it a miss this summer. But um, yeah, I wouldn't rule it out again in the future, definitely. Right then, next... Oh, God, I've picked up loads there. Um, da -da -da -da. Do you talk to other Villa YouTube channels other than Dan Bardell? Um, do you see any away games? Probably not away games, because that, that's our USP. We're the only real ones that go home and away, obviously. But we do have a good relationship with the majority of Villa fan channels. Obviously, we'll go out for drinks with them. We'll meet up with them because they're... They're genuine mates, aren't they? It's not like, oh, they run a YouTube channel as well. We better get along with them. Like they're they're genuine mates because quite a few of them have been doing them for for many years as well. The the two Dan's, Dan Rollinson, Dan Bardell, um, James Rushton, even like I've known him for, for many many years as well. Like it's a it's a great community, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, as you say, we, you know we're, we're we're really close to obviously Dan Bardell. We're close with the the, the guys in the Clarendon Blue podcast. We obviously we did some videos of them didn't we back at back at Christmas time with Dan Rollins and Matt Kendrick and uh, then we got to we got to know John Taylor didn't we last summer as well in America, in America yeah. uh, which which was really nice but yeah a lot of mutual respect between us all isn't there and uh, yeah and we all we all get on yeah yeah definitely and I think it's good for like creating content as well to see that sort of crossover between different channels I've been on various channels people have come on our channel when we see them at games yeah. and stuff and it's it's got that feel good factor hasn't it and we all sort of get on and sort of encourage each other to do well there's no sort of competition or snidiness 
us or anything like that. Like, there's just no need for nah. it. We all love the villain. We all want to succeed. And I think what's, what's good as well, we all have slightly different content. I think there's a running joke about there being so many Villa podcasts and stuff. But I think everyone's sort of got their own USP and different insights and, and things like that. So I think it, it does work pretty well. Yeah, and it was like, I always think back to last September when we all went to Dublin as well for the, for, to, to see Neil and Paddy for the, for the Love of Paul McGrath podcast. And they did a live podcast in Dublin. And um, obviously we were involved and, and, Dan, and Dan Bardell was involved as well. And it's just, that was just nice, you know, seeing sort of different sort of, um, sort of Villa content creators in the same room together and all sort of supporting each other and supporting Neil and Paddy essentially in their podcast, which was really good. So yeah, there's a lot of good people out there and uh, yeah, a lot of respect between us definitely uh, so this one comes from Matt kind of a little bit what we were just talking about pre-season but um, a dream pre-season tour location I think we talk about Japan and like the Far East quite a bit don't we I mean that yeah. would that would be expensive like you'd have to hope Villa weren't in Europe that season but just somewhere completely wild like the culture and just a completely different country like we've done a bit of Europe now and stuff but just going to like that part of the world would be wild yeah I think I yeah there was because there was a few rumours that we might be going to like the Far East um, uh, the, the, this summer for pre-season and I've got to be honest, that's one maybe I would have had to try to really sort of done all my best to get there because that's very different, isn't it? As you said, it would have been very expensive. So I'm not sure what I would have done there. Maybe robbed a bank or something, I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think Far East for me, definitely. I know they've done Australia in the past. I've never made my, made my way over to Australia. I know the last tour wasn't great though in terms of locations in Australia. And so miles between each other, sort of either weren't in the same sort of place, which makes traveling over from the UK absolutely a nightmare but yeah Far East I'd say definitely somewhere like Japan or Hong Kong or something like that yeah I'd love to do America again like the America trip like you said a minute ago was unbelievable like I'd love to do that again like you said those slightly different part of America maybe I mean there's so much in America it's so massive um, yeah I loved America right completely random one then this uh, which fallen club would you like to see back in the Premier League I think this comes from like from our point of view like where would you want to go or like an away day that you look forward to just seeing them back in the Premier League or whatever. I think for me I think I think there's a really obvious one for me maybe not for other people but for me it would be Sheffield Wednesday. I thought that as well. And the reason why because when I first started following Villa it was sort of the very late 90s very early 2000s and Sheffield Wednesday at that point were a Premier League side okay sort of struggling in the Premier League but I just remember the likes of like Benito Carbone playing for them and Paolo Di Canio and uh, when he famously pushed the ref over and stuff like that and so for me always in my head is that Sheffield Wednesday are, are, are a really big club and they should be a Premier League club and you look at like Hillsborough how they ho- like, like Hillsborough kind of reminds me of Villa Park in the way they hosted FA Cup semi-finals yeah. all over all over the years for uh, history um, so for me Sheffield Wednesday are a proper club a proper proper big club and like I'd love to see them back in the in the Premier League doesn't look too likely anytime soon they are struggling a little bit hopefully they stay up in the Championship this year um, but yeah for me Sheffield Wednesday yeah get them yeah. back in we we talked we we hadn't talked about this before we came on, but my answer was Sheffield Wednesday as well. I absolutely love Hillsborough. Like it's such yeah. a wicked stadium. Like it is it's so so good. They are a proper club. Um and it's a shame really. I mean there's so many out there though, isn't there? I mean it looks like Ipswich hopefully will get promoted. I think we'd yeah. we'd like to go there in the Premier League. Sunderland as well. Um there's plenty out there, isn't there, that, that that hopefully will be back in the Premier League one day. But I think for us it's gotta be Sheffield Wednesday. First thing you remember about Villa as a kid, who is your first favourite player? That comes from Stuart. I think my starting off going to the villa for me was under Alex McLeish when I was about 10. So um, apart from the last few years, it's been pretty crap. I think my first proper player that I loved was probably Ben Teke. Um I just think he was the first, like, you, you, like he got you off your seat like he was class like he would just put anything in the back of the net in such a poor side as well like we were so bad for so many years and for him to get 19 Premier League goals was just an absolute joke like he was a joke um, but yeah starting off on my Villa supporting career if you like didn't see a lot of good stuff so I think my, I see yeah mine obviously mine was a little bit earlier my, my sort of first introduction to Villa was as I say, late 90s. It was season 99-2000, season when we got to the FA Cup final. And my first game was the FA Cup third round tie against Darlington at Villa Park. And <laughs> now, there's a funny story with that one, though. We were Fallen sp- giant, Darlington? Not quite. <laughs> but we were. But funny story with that one, actually. That season, we were supposed to be playing, what a shock, we were supposed to be playing Manchester United in the third round of the FA Cup that year. Uh, but because Man United were competing at the Club World Cup, they had to withdraw. And so we ended up having Darlington in the third round and we beat them at Villa Park. And I remember it was, that was my first game with the old, it was the final season season of the old Trinity Road stand actually so I remember that um, and just that season I remember going to I weren't a season holder that year I just picked up the odd tickets with, with my dad and stuff um, I remember ga- a game against Watford at home and we beat them 4-0 and Paul Merson absolutely destroyed them and uh, and then I ended up going to the FA Cup semi-final at Wembley against Bolton as well and that was that, the, the old Wembley Stadium and that was and that, I just remember all like the old uh, sort of like bench seats and sort of like, <laughs> unstilt sort of bench seats and not proper seats yeah. and uh, so yeah a lot of my memories 
tend to come very late 90s, early 2000s. The John Gregory, I used to feel that side was really exciting. I do with the likes of Dion Dublin and Paul Merson and um, Benny Carbone. He was absolutely brilliant for that second half of that season. Um, so yeah, a lot of my memories come from there, really. I think there was, a bit, there was always a lot of criticism about John Gregory at the time. That he was a bit negative and stuff. But I absolutely loved that team and loved, and I just thought we were an absolutely brilliant team at the time. We were a lot of likeable characters. So yeah, that that's 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 the, always the one that sticks out. If somebody says, "What do you think?" You know, "What do you first think about Aston Villa?" I always goes back to that kit as well you know the the the, the stripey the stripey oh, kit the the one that's synonymous with Carboni and Merson and so yeah but for me like if I was going to pick a favourite player Paul Merson every single day of the week yeah I think my childhood was like I, I just think of it and it's like Gents and Casinos on the top it's Daffabet it's Brad Guzan and Goal it's it's that sort of time like even my cat is named after Brad Guzan because yeah. like when I was about 10 like he wasn't even because my cat randomly was born in 2012 Brad Guzan had one good season and that was after that so I don't know why I called him Bradley after the 11-12 season when he didn't play, did he really? Brad Guzan? Uh, he played 11, yeah, he played 11, who was that under? 11-12 11, 11, was McLeish, so it was sort of, sh- you know, sort of, so it was sort of shaggy given that year. And then it was, the, it was actually the year after when he had a good season, yeah, Guzan. Yeah. It was 2012 when he had a good nah, season. 12-13, he had a good, really good season. Brad Guzan, probably his only good season. But um, <laughs> yeah, he made, do you remember that double save he made against QPR? Do you remember that one? Where, like, I remember the, the one from a Chris Samba header yeah. right in the top corner. Yeah, and that, yeah, it was in the same move. Samba with like a header in the top corner, but then Samba absolutely smashed one was the top corner of his foot as well and Guzan said that it was literally the same like move it happened all in the space of about 40 seconds um, he had a brilliant season that year he just yeah. tailed off horrendously after that yeah he? I remember I remember recreating that save in my back garden randomly because yeah. that was like that was before I had a season ticket and I actually was at that QPR game it was a brilliant game actually um, but I remember recreating that, that save in my guards and I think what Vyman scored in that game as well I was just obsessed yeah. with that game I don't know why didn't Jermaine Gina score for QPR or something horrible he did it? yeah was it 3-2 was it free too, that yeah, game yeah and Josh free Townsend too. I think was playing for them as well like yeah, some well. real random ballers in that game but yeah Brad Guzan I don't know how we got into him so this one comes from I think it says Dave um, what is your number one petty gripe with Villa and how would you solve it I'm not really I'm not, does he mean about the team or does he mean no, about I just think in general like, I've got one I think it's the pre-match stuff and the half-time stuff. I don't like how the music is so loud, like as the players are walking out and stuff. Because I think, especially in a big game, like I think it was in the Ajax game, like I want to sing, like yeah. us in the upper hole, like we want to create something here. You've got the fireworks, you've got the smoke, you've got God knows what going on. You've got that weird light show. Like let us create something. Like it's it's us. <laughs> That's what it's going to intimidate teams coming. Not your weird light show. That's Ajax are going to come in and think, what the hell is that? Um, so just the really loud music, like before a game. I, a few people might know about Bangarang when that was playing for like weeks and weeks on end. I hated that. Um, but just like the pre-match stuff, like we could do so much better. I know the 1897 group who are trying to get something going in the atmosphere at Villa Park. They're meeting with the club at some point, aren't they? So in terms of banners and flags and B- Project B6 tried it. Just something like that. Let's be a little bit different. Let's let's create something new at Villa Park. See, yeah, I, I don't have a major one really, but I think my I, I agree with you by the way there because I thought exactly the same for the Ajax game. I thought just turn the music off because at that point Villa fans had started to sing and it was like, come on, just turn it off now because it will you know just get the atmosphere going. But they didn't. But um. I think this isn't really with the club, I suppose. This is just in general. I absolutely hate how, you know, it's always after a loss, usually. But you you go on social media and people are just tearing strips out of each other as supporters for not making an atmosphere or being too quiet or whatever. And, and I just think, you know, you're look, we're, 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 in, we're in modern football. We all know atmospheres throughout England aren't exactly, you know, absolutely incredible. We all know that. There's a lot worse stadiums than Villa Park, though, as as evidenced last week at the London Stadium and the other ones that we've been to. Like atmosphere at Villa Park at times, it can be a bit quiet at times, but then at other times, I think it can be really good. Like against Ajax at home, I thought the atmosphere was brilliant. I mean, I sit in the North Stand Upper, where let's be honest, it can be dead at times, and yet against Ajax, people are absolutely loving it in the Upper North, like really getting <laughs> songs going, started, and everything. So it's always that. It's just like we've got. I feel like we've got a little bit of an obsession about griping with each other about it singing or about creating atmospheres, and I just think I think there's I personally think there's worse problems going on personally yeah, it's, ju- it's just not the culture in England is it like it, we're not we're not Germany we're not Poland we're not Eastern Europe where they just don't stop yeah. like it's just not so yeah leaving early I mean the amount of comments I got on that Tottenham video and I left on 91 minutes and we were three 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 nil down like yeah. Who cares? And again, it's people who probably haven't even been to the game themselves. It's just trying to one-up each other and it's just annoying. Okay, this is quite a fun one. How do you and the boys all know each other? We met in Leipzig in the pre-season 2019. I think we just started chatting really, didn't we? I think I saw the tattoo on your leg and I thought, well, it's obviously a Villa-related tattoo and I just started chatting to you. And again, that's an example of 
sort of go into the football and people who maybe don't understand going to the football and yeah. understand the culture around it and meeting people and normally obviously historically when Villa have been pretty crap the game is the worst part of your day yeah. and it's just meeting up with people you have, who you haven't seen all week catching up and, and things like that that's wicked and obviously that's how we've grown to be best mates through Villa basically yeah it is it is and uh, and yeah and then it's the other people that come along it's like you, you you get to know them through other people sort of thing and then your sort of circle sort of grows but yeah it was Leipzig wasn't it, it was sitting in them sort of cobbled sort of side streets uh, yeah and get, get talking about my my, my villa tattoo and uh, yeah but yeah another another great trip wasn't it Leipzig in pre-season not a trip that you'd think would be absolutely amazing but it, it really was wasn't it was it? so good and then Owen I've known him since preschool when we were like two he went to college with Jamie so he brought him along and then I became mates with Jamie so like you said just the circle keeps yeah, on getting bigger and bigger and you just get to know more people it's brilliant it does but the, I, I think the nice you know the nice thing is we all bring our own little quirks too don't we we're all different we're all very different and uh, but we all get on amazing don't we and uh, yeah it's a, I feel really fortunate to be in like a really good group of 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 villa of villa mates essentially it's just nice it just it feels like it grows all the time doesn't it really there's always new people joining and stuff and uh yeah it's really good really enjoy it next one down to the last few so this one's from james rushton favorite european away day so far again i think they're all for like sort of different reasons though i remember coming out of luton airport was it after bosnia and we were saying like which one did you prefer, Alkmaar or, or Bosnia? I think Warsaw was brilliant because obviously it was the first one. We'll forget Hibs. The weather was good, whatever. But we lost the game. I think for me, it's between Alkmaar and Mostar, do you reckon? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think the... the or, I, I forgot about yeah, Amsterdam the there, to be fair. The three for me are up there. It's Alkmaar, Amsterdam and Mostar. For, for all very different reasons, obviously. Um, Alkmaar because we obviously won and obviously that felt uh, great. And we did a lot in that trip, didn't we? We went to... Um, did the tour of the, the of the final ground in Rotterdam, the scene of Villa's you know most triumph, my biggest triumph really. Um, we did the Ajax tour. Obviously, we didn't know we were going to be going back there. Maslow was just uh, incredible because it was so quirky, wasn't it? It's such a lovely place. It was so so quirky. I absolutely loved that trip. And then Amsterdam was just great because it felt like every single Villa fan on the planet was there, didn't it? And we <laughs> and we had a you know a good few drinks and we did a, we did a fair bit. And that was you know going to the Johan Cruyff Arena, watching Villa play there at one of those big stadiums. It's a historic team. It was absolutely incredible as well. So yeah, all for different reasons. Um, I don't know if I could pick one. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's close, but I'd pick Mostar just because it was so completely random and it was brilliant and it was a country that I'd never been to before, obviously a, a city slash town that I'd never been to before and it was beautiful, like it was it such a lovely place. In, yeah, in terms of seeing in terms of seeing the place and I think um, I think it would be Mostar for me as well, 100%. It was it was just so quirky, wasn't it? Um, uh, yeah, only like a week or so before Christmas. It, yeah, it did feel quite special, that one. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one, definitely. It's, it's, it's sort of one that you just won't forget ever like that must one it was it was unbelievable last couple then um how how long does it take to edit a match day video um you can answer this because you're the one who's snoring in bed when we're on european trips next to me while i'm up till 2 a.m editing the bloody videos yeah so well you wouldn't know because you're fast asleep I, it takes a good few hours though doesn't it uh obviously because uh yeah i'm i'm fast asleep and uh, and yeah max doesn't finish till what two three in the yeah, morning i mean the, the america the america trip was mad because we basically did a video every day and obviously we were out all day every day so it's like oh god i've got to edit till 4 a.m we've got a flight at 6 a.m like it was wicked um but i'd normally probably say about three hours or so i mean if we've lost i'll just want to get it out uh, just two hours um but it's normally around three hours maybe four hours with editing making thumbnails things like this thinking of a title doing the description doing all the tags on youtube like there's a lot that goes into it and there's a lot to think about um but yeah i'd say about three hours so obviously when it's a night game you're up till two or three in the morning um on, on a saturday it's decent because you can sort of still have your evening um but yeah it's it's a lot but i love it and last but not least is it going to be a good one? I think we've you've kind of already answered it really, but I will ask it anyway. So, could you ever see YouTube being your full time job? Could it ever be financially viable? I mean, somebody else asked a question that I hadn't included about how many subscribers would you need to make it your full time job, but it isn't based off that though. It's based on views. Obviously, that generates ad revenue and things like that. So, I don't I don't know because <laughs> it depends on how Villa how well Villa do. Obviously, views go up when Villa do well because people want to watch the content. If we've lost, no one's going to sit and watch a vlog of us losing unless it's the opposition fan. So I think with Europe and stuff like it's it's generating more games, which obviously generates more revenue. But obviously that goes 
back into the channel. Like, I'll buy new cameras to create better content. I'll buy new mics. I'll spend the money on, obviously, paying for Amsterdam or paying for Lille and paying for travel and stuff. So a lot of it, it's not just going into my back pocket and happy days, I'm, I'm getting loads of money here. Like, it's reinvested into the channel and I wouldn't want it any other way. Like, I want to create better content and things like that. And I think people can sort of see that. I think if you watch videos from four, five, six years ago, like you'll see the difference in quality. Um, and that's obviously down to me becoming better at editing or getting used to what I need to do and things like that. But I think I've reinvested into the channel. I mean, you know more than anyone, I've got about a billion cameras that I take to games now just for different things, yeah. just to create the best content. So at some point maybe, but I don't see it realistically. But I think it works well though because I haven't got the pressure of thinking, oh God, I need this many views to pay my rent this month and things like that. Like I've got a, a nice nine to five job, which I'm very lucky is quite flexible in terms of, you know, I can go to weekend games and I can book half days and things like that. So I am very lucky in, in, in that side of things. Um, but yeah, it's a nice mix at the moment in terms of having Villa on tour as an outside weekend thing and then uh, my work nine to five. So yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's that fear, isn't it? I suppose it's that fear of, as you say, you having to have that pressure on, oh, I need to produce some content so I get some money this month. Well, I, think that's where the, I think that's where the quality might drop. Yeah, exactly. Because I think if you're, if you're thinking, oh, God, what content do I do? And you can't think of anything. And you're just doing it for the sake of it or pushing out loads and loads of videos just to get loads of views. That's where, you, what, that's where your quality drops. And I don't do previews or post-match reactions, probably because I don't have the time and stuff. But I, I don't my passion is creating content at the game and having that USP of going to the games and having that personality and stuff, not just sort of sitting on a podcast. And that's not a dig at anyone who does that, like obviously, but I don't know. I think I like how it is at the moment and stuff. Like we don't normally do a lot of sit down videos and stuff. Like it is just the match day vlogs, it's just the international breaks. I thought we'd get together and have a bit of a laugh and stuff, but yeah. Yeah, that's it really. <laughs> yeah, so that's all the questions really. A, a lot of people asked and a lot of people got involved on Twitter um, and Instagram. So thank you so much for that. If you didn't get your question answered, I do apologise. There was absolutely loads. So thank you to everyone who got involved. If you don't already follow us on Twitter and Instagram, please go and do that. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I know it's been a slightly different form of content. Um, this will go out on audio only platforms as well. So this will be on Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, things like that. So don't go and follow our podcast over there. The Villain Tour podcast, go and search that on Spotify, Apple, whatever it is and you will find it there'll be a link in the description as well again a massive thank you to hockley social club for having us it's a wicked space so if you're ever in the area on a friday or saturday night or whenever really come down it's such a cool place live music anything and they're so kind to us here as well letting us film uh, so thank you so much hockley social club for that thank you so much for watching this video the next time we shall see you will be next week for a half five kickoff a tasty kickoff time against local rivals Wolves. we shall see you then up the villa